Good evening, church family. God bless you and welcome to Golden Triangle Church on the Rock. You know, tonight we are going to be enjoying our Thanksgiving message. And so get ready to have a heart of Thanksgiving and get ready also to learn a little bit of history. You know, I can't help myself but to share just a little bit of history. Before we get started, let's pray and ask God's grace not only on us tonight as our hearts are open to the Word of God, but also upon our nation. Our nation needs a good word from God tonight. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your hand of blessing, Lord, on our hearts and minds. And Lord, we thank you, Father, for America. We thank you, God, that you bless America, Lord. God bless our national leaders, Lord, our community leaders, Father. And Lord, we pray that as you, Lord, hear us cry to you according to Chronicles, Lord, that, Father, you, Lord, will hear, you will forgive, Lord, and you will heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be going to the book of Deuteronomy just a little bit later. But first, let me fill you in just a little bit on the season we are in, this season of Thanksgiving for the United States of America. It was during the time of the reign of King James I. This is the same King James, by the way, that we have the King James Bible. Uh, it was translated in 1611. So during the 1600s, King James in England, you know, he really wanted a little more control and a little more autonomy, uh, you know, o over the church. And so uh, the Church of England became the state governed church. And this state church, uh, it, 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 uh, it wanted to control, and as King James did, not only what was taught in the church, but the doctrine and how the children were raised. And, and uh, it, it kind of ran afoul during those years of some people who were more religiously pure, they felt. So, Around, you know, the early 1600s, there was a group of people who uh, kind of called themselves religious Puritans. They broke away from the Church of England and they encountered persecution for that. Well, as time went along, along about 1620, a small group of these Puritans joined themselves together with another group that were going to be making a voyage to the Americas. And they boarded the Mayflower, okay? And uh, as they made Made their 66 day journey across the Atlantic Ocean, you know, facing storms and peril, you know, and the mask of the ship cracked and, you know, um, uh, one person died on the way and, you know, a baby was born. All of the difficulties they ended up after that 66 days making that journey and pulling into Cape Cod area in Upper New England. Well, this was not where they were supposed to be. Uh, you know, history tells us that these two groups of people that were on board the Mayflower, uh, the Puritans called themselves saints, and they called the other group strangers, okay? Saints and strangers. Well, uh, they had a little difference of opinion. The difference of opinion was uh, uh, not just along some religious lines and some political lines, but also the strangers felt as though that the contract they had for the the land that they had uh, supposed to land it in in Virginia was not good, uh, you know, in Upper New England. So, you know, they didn't know what to do. They were not only divided, uh, you know, between these two groups, saints and strangers, but they were also divided within the groups as to whether their contract for land purchase had been canceled or what they were supposed to do. So. Over the next uh, few months, from November, you know, they, they landed Cape Cod and they sailed northward along the coast up to Plymouth. And then uh, landing there, they would leave the ship, even though they stayed on board the ship and slept, they would leave the ship and they would go, you know, on, onto dry land there at Plymouth and they began to build houses because it was wintertime. The conditions on board uh, the Mayflower, uh, it, it was a cargo ship. And they were counted as little more than cargo by the ship's master. Uh, you know, it was dark and it was wet and it was cold. It was, you know, uh, and during that winter, even though only one person had died on the voyage across the Atlantic, during that winter time on board that ship while they were building all the way to March of 1621, approximately half of those 102 passengers died that winter. 
What a tragedy, you know, uh, what, a, what a difficult situation. On top of that, there was the arguments, the fightings, the, you know, uh, they didn't even know if they would be able to stick together or even wanted to work together. They had so much, uh, they, they had so many differences, but they had one thing in common, and it was the purpose for which they had made that journey. So, before they disembarked in March of 1621, 41 men, a group representing the strangers and the saints, came together and put together a small agreement, which we now know as the Mayflower Compact. And in this brief agreement, this body politic, they decided that they would major on what they did agree on and not on what they didn't agree on. Uh, they, they had so many differences, yet the one thing they had in common was going to bind them together. And when these 41 men signed the Mayflower Compact, they ceased to be called strangers and saints. You know, isn't that wonderful? And they became what we know and we remember as the pilgrims. These pilgrims, uh, they agreed on this Mayflower Compact. It was a very uh, interesting document. In fact, I want to read it. It's, it's, it's brief. Let me read it to you so that we can see what they actually agreed on, okay? And listen closely because it still figures into our traditional Thanksgiving, okay? The Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith, and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the north and northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by the virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony under which we promise all due submission and obedience. Now that's very, very brief. In fact, do you know that the Mayflower Compact was originally written on the back of a, uh, of a lesson, uh, a Hebrew alphabet lesson. That's right, the, the uh, pilgrims on their voyage here were learning Hebrew. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, at one point, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, King's College, which is now Columbia, all of these major universities, do you know that the commencement exercises were given in Hebrew? In fact, uh, uh, the original intent of the language of the Americas had been proposed to be Hebrew because they wanted to break, of course, with the English tradition, and so they were all learning Hebrew, and Hebrew was very interesting. But that's not where the connection uh, stopped here. These um, pilgrims felt as though they were um, reenacting, a reenactment, as it were, of the children of Israel called by God to leave Egypt. They had overlaid, and we've been talking about overlays in the Bible, how we can overlay our life on, on certain accounts in the Bible, and we can get a better picture of what we're going through. Well, uh, they had this biblical roadmap as well. You know, the Bible is not just a history book, it's a road map for our life. And how they laid their life on it, they felt like England was Egypt and King James was the Pharaoh and the Atlantic Ocean was their Red Sea. They believed that America was the promised land and they even imagined that the Native American Indians were the Canaanites 
that had occupied the promised land before the children of God arrived. Uh, you know, and uh, the Native Americans, of course, worshiping pagan, idolatrous gods, they felt as though that God had disinherited them and had given uh, here the, uh, uh, the believers, the Christians, his children, this new promised land. Well, that's what they believed. And that's one of the reasons why they put together this Mayflower Compact. They felt as though and were in unity. Did you hear what, what uh, you know, in the first two sentences, God is mentioned four separate times. Look, it says, uh, uh, you know, it, it begins, in the name of God. Well, that's why they came. They came in the name of God, you know, as, as, as many had done before, as Christopher Columbus in 1492, uh, as those who began to come in 1493 and uh, 1547 and, you know, 1598. On and on and on, we have all of these historical records and accounts of God bringing people on a mission, them feeling as though they were empowered by God to go on this destined journey, you know, not just in the name of God, but also the second thing that they wrote, uh, by the grace of God. They not only came in the name of God, but they came by the grace of God. Just like Christopher Columbus had said, it was not by the use of maps or sextants or any such thing, but, you know, it, the fact that the gospel had to be preached to so many people in such a short time, you know, by the grace of God, it was that which was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah saying, you know, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, our nation was founded by men and women who were giving their all for a cause that they believed God had called them to. In the name of God, by the grace of God. And then, you know, once again, for the glory of God. That's what the Mayflower Compact says. This is for the glory of God. It's not, you know, for, for our own glory. This is for the glory of God. We are making this journey for the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? You know, uh, the pilgrims, this... Thanksgiving that we look back to, you know, um, began by people who set out on a journey in the name of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, and then finally, in the presence of God. In the name of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, in the presence of God. But what was the purpose? Well, the purpose, they said, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith. You see, these pilgrims came here not just for religious freedom, not just for the right to educate their children in the ways of the Lord and to hold themselves accountable to Almighty God for how they lived, but they also came to advance the Christian faith. That's why our nation was founded. And they, these brave Christian pioneers, believed what you and I believe, that God has a plan, that God will succeed, and that we have a chance to participate. They took their chance. They believed that they were on a divine mission from God. They were called by God, delivered from their Egypt and from the tyranny of a king that was, that was persecuting their religious freedoms and, and controlling and democratizing the, 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 the church, as it were. And so they took this journey in the name of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, in the presence of God. They knew God was with them. And they did it to advance the Christian faith. And during that first winter, you know, as I said, half of them died from just exposure to the elements, coughs, colds, sneeze, sniffles, flu, things that, you know, that uh, just, you know, cost them half of, you know, like, like the children of Israel, you know. Uh, it, it's, it, it cost. In fact, destiny provides strength to the martyrs chosen by God to weather the storms of life and endure the hardships great births demand. Great births demand that we endure some hardships and weather some storms. You know, uh, the kingdom of God, as every kingdom even on earth, is advanced by the blood of those willing to give their lives 
for something beyond their life, something greater than their life. The founding documents of our nation were so deeply rooted in the Word of God, so closely governed by the simple truths that we find in God's Word. Just as with Israel in the times of Moses, in the times of Joshua, so it is even with us and with every generation. The Word of God is a road map, and God expects us to follow His guidelines and to be thankful. You know, that autumn in 1621, the Wampanoag Indians had helped the pilgrims. There they had learned how to plant things that they had never known before. They learned how to cultivate the soil in a way in this new land and how to reach out into the abundance of streams and, and wildlife and, and you know, were able to, to harvest a great harvest. And for the children of Israel, they considered that in their autumn harvest, what we look back as that first New England Thanksgiving. They considered it their Feast of Tabernacles, their Yom Kippur, the autumn harvest time, just like it was in the days of Moses and Joshua, just like it was in the days of uh, how they read in the Word of God. It was their Day of Atonement, and it was their Feast of Thanksgiving towards God for being with them and for helping them. And that's still what we celebrate today. Moses encouraged the children of Israel in a time whenever he realized they were going to be going into a land of abundance. And this is one of the scriptures, one of the passages that the pilgrims used to help guide them during this particular time. Allow me to read our text for this evening, which I believe is a direct admonition from our Heavenly Father to us right now. Okay? Listen to this. I'll be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 8, the New Living Translation, and we'll read the whole chapter together. Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey His commands. Yes, He humbled you by letting you go hungry, then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not blister or swell. Now, let me stop there for just a moment. You know, the Bible says in the 40 years that the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness. Their clothes did not wear out, their feet did not swell, yet 500 thousand of them died in the wilderness. No doubt God was with them. No doubt God watched over them. No doubt God protected them. No doubt God led them and fed them. But it also cost, just like it did the pilgrims, just like it does with any worthy endeavor, it cost the pilgrims half of their whole you know, uh, group that first winter. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out, your feet did not blister or swell. Think about it, verse 5 says. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and fearing Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates, of oil, uh, olive, and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is as abundant, is, is, is abundant in the hills. Uh, can, you, can you see this? You know? Can you see why? Uh, not only these pilgrims, but also the promise of God as we look back 
God was certainly blessing our forefathers with such a great abundance of goods, natural resources. Verse 10, when you have eaten your fill, it doesn't say if, it says when. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be sure to thank the Lord and praise the Lord, remembering it's the Lord that did it. But this is a time to be careful, verse 11 says. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey His commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large, and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Listen to me now. Verse 15, Do not forget that He led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all of this so that you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth by my own strength and energy. Oh, may we never say to ourselves that we have achieved what we have achieved by our own strength, by our own wisdom, by our own might, by our own energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant He confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Listen to me now, America. Listen today. Verse 19, But I assure you of this, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Just as the Lord has destroyed other nations, in your path. You also will be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God." What an admonition that was upon our forefathers, these pilgrims. No wonder they decided in the fall of that year that they would offer themselves in thanksgiving towards God. We too have an opportunity today Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by, na by na my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, no longer saints and strangers, no longer Democrats and Republicans, no longer black and white, no longer on opposite sides or divisions even among ourselves or within our own groups, but if we would realize that we may have differing opinions, but we have one good common goal, and that is we have been called by God. In the name of God, for the glory of God, by the grace of God, in the presence of God, to advance His kingdom. And for having been chosen by Him and having been given all of the abundant resources that we have in this great land, America, how much more should we be thankful and join our hearts together today tomorrow and every day. Be thankful. Be thankful you've been chosen by God and blessed by God. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless you and God bless America. Thanks for joining us online. You know, I trust that you have a church home. And if you live in Southeast Texas, you have an opportunity to be a part of so many wonderful works of God. But perhaps you live in a place somewhere that maybe you can't get out right now and attend church. Maybe our church is the only opportunity or one of your chosen opportunities to hear the Word of God. Please join us on a consistent basis if that is a reality. And when your local church opens back up, I encourage you to become a faithful supporter of that work as well. Each Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, 
and each Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Texas time, I promise to have the Word of God ready for you, a fresh word from God that will make a difference in your life, your week. Connect with us. Go to cotr.com and you'll find a place there to send your prayer request. While we have this relationship online, I want to make sure that we make it as meaningful as possible, even though there's no distance in the Spirit. Yet, we have to work harder to stay connected. If you'll just fill out that Connect card and leave your prayer request, I will make sure that we pray for you. You know, I know times are tough, but prayer will see us through. As well, you'll find a place to participate in stewardship. Every day we are reaching the world from Church on the Rock through drilling water wells, through feeding the hungry, meeting the needs of those less fortunate in our community and communities like ours around the world. That takes resources. I want to thank you in advance for the resources you supply to do God's work. I believe with all of my heart that you can make a difference, especially in these difficult and stressful times that we are facing. Don't forget, however, if you have a local church to which you are committed, your tithes and your offerings belong there. Be a faithful supporter of God's work. And I promise you, things are going to get better. God has a way of making things better. May God bless you. May God encourage you. May God strengthen your heart. In Jesus' name. I'll see you next time, right here at Church Online. This program is brought to you through the faithful support of the members and partners of Golden Triangle Church on the Rock. For more information about our church or to find other programming and additional resources, check out our website at www.cotr.com. Join us here next time. And until then, we pray God blesses you to make a living, make a life, and make a difference.